Hey guys! Welcome to 42H Shibuya Scramble. This is DJ Your Gamer Girl signing on. So. I don't know a whole lot about this game. Just basically, you know, what the screenshots showed and what the summary showed on the, st on the Steam page. And it looked like fun. Especially since it's live action instead of CG or anime. Let's go. You want the guide to gameplay to be displayed. I recommend that for first. Okay, yeah, because I have no idea. Oh shit, I hope that girl's okay. Shibuya story is yours to tell. Select a character. 
As you play through the game, the various mechanics will be explained. In 428, you follow the stories of multiple protagonists at once. Your decisions impact their experiences as you read the story. What does the day hold in store? Their fate is in your hands. Hopefully, you can see them all through to the end. To start, you have two characters, Shinya Kano and Achi Endo. Let's begin by checking out Kano's story. Just two more minutes to go. Is there a way to turn down? No? Right, give me a sec. There. Hopefully you can still hear that. Shinya Kano noted the time again on his watch, scowling at the slow creep of the second hand. The time was 9.58 a.m. Furrows of consternation creased his forehead. He wasn't nervous, but he knew better than to expect everything to go smoothly. Keeping a level head was proving rather difficult. There was no room for failure. Lives were on the line here. He eyed its surroundings. Was the perp really going to show up? When? Where would he be coming from? How would he make his approach? The Shibuya scramble was as packed as ever. A throng of, bi of people crossing this way and that, blissfully unaware. Of the dozens of detectives hidden in its mist. All right, another minute and a half. Kano glanced down at his watch yet again. A mere 30 seconds had passed. Detective Kano had been with the enforcement arm of Shibuya's criminal affairs section for a year now, but he'd never been part of an operation this big before. He eyed the young woman standing beside the statue of the head. She was small enough to get lost in the crowd, and she carried a nondescript attache case. Attache case. Hitomi Osawa, age 19. The attache case in her hands contained a full 50 million yen in cash. Yesterday, her twin sister Maria had been kidnapped. This was a ransom payment. The culprit had called Hitomi last night at home, referring to her by name and telling her to wait by the statue of Hachiko in Shibuya. It was almost time, but nothing. Kano was staring fixedly at the second hand on his watch when a homeless man sitting on the sidewalk murmured just loud enough for him to hear. Come on, Kano. Quit looking at your watch so much. What if the kidnapper sees you? Kano tried to, nonchal tried to look nonchalant as he lifted his eyes, but the scruffy character continued. You're too nervous. Just relax already. You're the one acting suspicious, Sasayama. Kano frowned. Why would some homeless guy be talking to me? Some words and phrases in the text appear uh, in blue. These are called tips. Press X to underline the tip, then press A. This will let you read some extra info relating to that word or phrase. There are tips containing general knowledge and ones that are 428 specific. These are marked with a magnifying glass and a 428, respectively. 
Yoji Sasayama was the senior officer of the Shibuya Precinct's Criminal Affairs Division, five years older than Kano. Uh, responsible for the safety of approximately 200,000 people in 32 neighborhoods, including Uehara, Ugui Sudanicho, Udagawacho, Ebisu, Ebisu Nishi, Ebisu Minami, Oyamacho, Kameyamacho, Sakura Gao Kacho, Sasazuka, Sakura Kucho, Shibuya, Shoto, Jinkumae, Shin Sencho, Jinnan, Sen Dagaya, Daikanyaman Macho, Dogenzaka, Tomigaya, Nanpe Daicho, Nishihara, Hatagaya, Hachiyamacho, Hatsudai, Higashi, Hiro, Hon Honmachi, Mariamacho, Moto Yoyogicho, Yoyogi, and Yoyogi Kamizoncho, Zonocho. He always went a little overboard with his disguises. He claimed it was all part of the job. Mm, but word around the station was that he just liked playing dress up. Hey pal, spare some change. Sasayama lurched to his feet and shuffled close to Kano. Hey, knock that off! Fittingly for the part, Sasayama reeked pretty badly. Well, ain't so suspicious now, huh? He clung to Kano with the mock camaraderie, despite the younger man's attempts to pull away. I kind of wish there was voice acting. I would have, I would, I would have loved to hear these actors voice their lines. Come on, Sasayama, cut it out! Sasayama's blithe confidence rattled Kano's nerves. Of course, there was good reason for that confidence. This was Kano and Sasayama's jurisdiction, but they were positioned a good distance from where the handoff was to take place. Particular region over which an organization or a member thereof has control or authority. Basically, like NYPD having jurisdiction over New York City. The Metropolitan Police Department, at the pinnacle of Tokyo's police hierarchy, has vastly more authority than the local precincts. But since many officers wind up needing to work with both, the outright rivalry between the two isn't as noticeable as TV dramas may make it seem. The statue of Hachiko was surrounded. Sometimes two or more tips will appear on a single screen. Press X repeatedly to change which words are underlined. Well, I. <laughs> the statue of Hachiko was surrounded. Oh, that's what it means. By elite investigators from one of HQ's special investigation teams. Bronze statue of a dog erected in 1934. The dog was famous for loyally waiting for his absent master. Well known as a meet as a meetup spot outside of Shibuya Station, other popular meetup spots at the station are the display car for the original Tokyo 5000 series, commonly known as the Green Frog, and the Moyai statue by the west entrance. HQ here refers to the Metropolitan Police Department. The Tokyo Police Station is responsible for managing 101 precincts within the city, Japan's largest police organization. In addition to the police in Tokyo, it has various other duties and authorities for maintaining public order in the capital. Kano and his partner were just there to provide backup of the kidnapper attempt to flee. Look, just try to relax, we'll be fine. Sasayama gave him a wink. A moment later, the radio squawked in Kano's ear. Alright everyone, it's time. Keep your eyes open. The voice coming through the earpiece was Koji Kuze, HQ's operations director. The individual responsible for directing the investigation in the event of a serious crime. If a task force is set up, the operations director is the one who assumes command. TV dramas and other fictional accounts often feature some young prodigy from the MPD as operations director, but in reality, the position usually goes to a proven veteran, which is, you know, you would expect that. Unless the young guy was a proven genius. 
Until last year, he'd been the Shibuya Precinct's head detective and Kano supervisor. We don't know when the perp is going to make contact. Don't let your guard down. Kusei's low, gravelly voice echoed in Kano's ear. You don't sound too worried, Kusei. Kano winced at Sasayama's words. How could the man be so nonchalant? The appointed time had come and gone. Something should be happening. Whap! Kano smacked himself in the thigh to release a little tension. The sound was louder than he'd intended. Though the suit hit his muscular physique, it did little to dampen the noise. He needed to stay focused. He might be called to action at any moment. The department handled abduction cases according to a certain standard investigation procedure. Was it an attempt to extort money? Or was the motive something personal? The answer to that question determined how they deal with the criminal. And based on the investigation team's initial findings this time around, they probably weren't dealing with a professional kidnapper. Still, in all likelihood, it was someone with quite a long rap sheet. Probably someone who knew the family, but so far they had few leads on who might bear such a grudge. With the situation so unclear, the plan was to apprehend whomever came to make the handoff on sight. If the culprit ran with the money, there'd be no guarantee of the hostage will be. Oh, we just saved. Still nothing. Sasayama muttered. There he is! He's here! Kuze broke in, his voice spiking into an excited chirp. Kuze's particular voice quirk. Whenever he gets overly flustered, excited, or panicked, he slips into a childish register prone to babbling and pitching his voice. <laughs> so his, his voice went up. Subject is a young male in his 20s, wearing a bandana and an orange hoodie. Kuze, normally calm and stoic, was now squawking like an excited child. That only happened when he got particularly worked up. Kano and Sasayama steeled themselves. They could see the subject now. A 20-something male nonchalantly approached Hitomi to talk to her. Alright, people. Be ready to grab this guy. Kuzi was stationed in the mobile command center not far from the intersection, keeping tabs on the situation via video surveillance from the camera team. The young man started speaking enthusiastically to Hitomi. The detectives watched, uncertain. Was this really the kidnapper? That's gotta be him. Connor took a step forward and then hesitated. You'll encounter selections like these during the story. These choices will change the lives of other people, in addition to changing your own fate. Current choice will not impact you or any of the other protagonists. So this is just to, uh, uh, to showcase this can happen. You need to be careful from now on. The situation still wasn't entirely clear. He needed to get a better look at things. Yeah, we don't want to rush into it. The situation still wasn't entirely clear. He needed to get a better look at things. The newcomer held a bundle of letter-sized paper which he showed to Hitomi as he went on talking. He tried to hand her one of the papers, but she point pointedly ignored him. Undeterred, the man kept trying to foist it off on her. Hitomi refused to respond, becoming as motionless as a statue of Hachiko behind her. Until finally, the man gave up and walked away. He was just one of those flyer passers. That face! <laughs> I love that face. <laughs> they they paused this particular um, unless these are actual photos and he was specifically asked to <laughs> to make that face or he just made that face ad libbed. They they paused the video when they were initially recording this for the game at just the right moment. <laughs> Guess it wasn't him. Kano felt the tension of the moment linger in his spine. Guy must have been hitting on her, Sasayama muttered. Succeeding a meeting at meeting someone on the fly like this takes a special knack. Looks are also important. Sometimes, of course, the person trying to get your attention out of nowhere is just trying to make a sales pitch for a product or a nearby establishment. 
At first glance, it isn't always to tell the difference. It isn't always easy to tell the difference. I mean, she is pretty cute and all. He had a point. Though, of course... Something in Sasayama's voice made Kano brace himself. She's got nothing on my Mi-chan. Mi-chan was Sasayama's wife. They got married just last month. What <laughs> that face! <laughs> Let me tell you, Kano, Mary life is the best. You gotta hurry up and give it a try for yourself. <laughs> and poor, poor Kano, he's just like douche. <laughs> what? What is the control for hiding the thing? It, can I hide the thing? No? Oh, I can! <laughs> Kano! Kano's just looking at him like, Dude, shut up! I don't want to hear it! This was Sasayama's favorite spot, favorite topic lately, and Kano was getting more and more fed up with it. Sasayama, come on, just knock it off, okay? The phrase had become a common refrain of his, of his since the department partnered them. Fine, fine. Let's talk about your girlfriend then. Huh? Now? You can't be serious. Sasayama leaned in close again. What's she like? We're not having this conversation. Kano muttered, looking away. Ah, oh, come on! Sasa Sasayama set his hand on Kano's chest, still playing the homeless troublemaker. <laughs> Show me your phone. Let me see your lock screen. Huh? Sasayama pawed for the phone. You got a picture of your girl on your lock screen, yeah? I, I do not! But he did. It was scary how on the mark Sasayama's instincts were. Hey, cut it out! We're in the middle of an investigation! I am investigating, Sasayama chuckled as he plucked the phone from Kano's pocket. <laughs> These faces! I swear! <laughs> and Kano actually kind of looks like he's gonna kill Sasayama, not gonna lie. His face scrunched up with astonishment as he looked at the lock screen. The heck is this? It, it, it's not... Ain't this Masumi Nagahama? A national star tends to play the heroine on national morning soap operas or in national historical dramas. Her songs have been a series of national hits, and she's even slated to host the year-end national singing competition program. Everything about her is national. Oh, so you're dating a, a star, huh? Kano realized he had to bite the bullet. No, that's my girlfriend. Her name's Rumi, and she's... Sasayama cut him off. You're telling me in the same Masam... You're telling me this ain't Masami Nagahama, the famous actress. Because this right here is Masami Nagahama. Like I said, sly old dog. Trying to make it like, trying to make like you're dating Masami Nagahama. I'm not. I mean, I guess Rumi does kind of look like her. Sasayama let out a half. For real. You really think I'm going to fall for that? There's nothing to fall for, I swear. Sasayama scowled, unconvinced. Alright, then why don't you marry her? Kano stammered, but he had no answer. The truth was, he would have happily married her already. But there were... obstacles that needed to be overcome. Okay, playtime's over. Let's focus on the job. If that is the actress, from what I hear, a lot... She's also a singer. From what I hear, the... Um, the industry is not so... kind. To stars that get married. And especially when they have such obsessive fans. Like, the original Japanese actor for Levi in Attack on Titan apologized for getting married because his fans were upset. I wish I was joking. Sasayama handed back Kano's phone and turned his gaze back to Hitomi. Kano let out a quick, uneasy sigh. But his shoulders did feel looser. Maybe Sasayama had been trying to relieve him a bit... Trying to relieve a bit of tension. Maybe he should be grateful. By now, 
Several minutes had passed since the guy with the papers had gone away. He peered at Hitomi. The strain on her face was visible. In addition to the weight of the attaché case itself, the 5,000... The 5,000... 10,000 yen bills of Jesus Christ. It held weight close to 6 kilos. Her slender arms must have been getting tired. Still, she refused to set the case down. She wasn't taking any chances with her sister's life. The kidnapping case had begun the day before, at around 7 p.m. This is MBD Dispatch. Shibuya Precinct is reporting a missing person, believed to be an abduction. In Japanese law, the act of indirectly luring or deceiving someone into the control of a third party is known as kidnapping. Using forcible threats or violence to achieve the same result is known as abduction. Okay, so there's a difference between the two. Subject is Maria Osawa, a 19-year-old student at Midoriyama Academy, last seen at the LL Diner near campus. A man was allegedly seen forcing her into a car nearby. All officers in the vicinity report to the scene at once. Kano and Sasayama had been working a burglary case in Jugamai's 5th district when they got the call. The two arrived at the LL Diner at 7.15pm. At roughly the same time, several other officers showed up to secure the area, blocking off entry to nearby roadways and monitoring the surrounding establishments. Inside the restaurant, Kano and Sasayama were met by the girl who reported the kidnapping. It was the victim's twin sister, Hitomi. Could you tell us about when Mario was taken, starting from the very beginning? Kano said, keeping his voice low. I... My sister and I... We were supposed to go to a party together today. Hitomi was trembling, her voice hoarse. But I messed up the time. I showed up right at seven, an hour later than I was supposed to. So Maria had gone to the party, a mixer for locals and exchange students. Hitomi, arriving late, had showed up just in time to glance out through the restaurant window and see her sister getting shoved into a car. She described the vehicle as a blue station wagon of Japanese make. Why? Why would someone some why would something like this happen to her? Hitomi held back her tears, but she was shaking all over. Did you get a good look at the kidnapper? Yes. It was a man, middle-aged. There was another eyewitness, Leland Palmer. He identified himself as a lecturer at Hitomi and Maria's school. I saw two. It's like Hitomi says. I heard Hitomi cry out, so I uh, went to the window to look. And his Japanese was halting, as if he hadn't been in the country very long. And I think that maybe the kidnapper was working alone. Leyland explained as he'd seen the man shove that he'd seen the man shove Maria into the back seat, then clamber into the driver's seat. If he had an accomplice, they wouldn't wouldn't they have been driving? Neither Hitomi nor Leyland had gotten a look at the suspect's face. Kano was interviewing others who had been on the scene, looking for other potential witnesses when his phone rang. It was Yoshio Kajiwara, one of the senior detectives. We've set up a task force for the investigation. Get back to the station once you have a handle on the situation there. Barely a half an hour had passed between the time of the kidnapping was before the between the time the kidnapping was reported and the time the task force began operation. Roughly 150 people are working on the case in the Shibuya Precinct's conference room. The main force at work is HQ's first special investigation unit. Additionally, other detective sections, a riot squad, and investigators from neighboring precincts have been assembled. When Kano and Sasayama got back to the precinct station, Kuse had already arrived from HQ. He informed them that a response team had been formed to investigate the victim's home. In a case where someone has been abducted for ransom, it is often difficult to resolve the situation without cooperating with the victim's family. But the family can also be a hindrance in making an arrest. To help guide the family's actions, a response team is assembled and stationed at the victim's home, led by an investigator with the proper training. Kano could feel a peculiar tension in the air, unfamiliar. MPD detectives scurry to, f scurry to and fro around the Shibuya offices. He pulled one of them aside to get a quick update. 
An hour had passed since the kidnapping. There had been one new development. The perpetrator had made a threatening call to the victim's home. He said the following. Tomorrow, 10 a.m. by Hachiko and Shibuya. Have the sister Hitomi bring me 50 million yen. If not, the girl's life is forfeit. Kajiwara, from the precinct, was put on the response team, along with the detectives from elsewhere who'd received special training in abduction cases. Normally, a local precinct detective wouldn't have gone undercover in a victim's home. Kuze, however, had decided that having a knowledgeable local was crucial, and had sent Kajiwara along. The detectives disguised, them disguised themselves as delivery people and mo movers to make their way inside without arousing suspicion, arriving there at 8.30. The response team had come prepared to run a trace if the kidnapper contacted the family a second time. The act of pinpointing the source of an incoming phone call. The police are not allowed to do this independently without oversight. They must go through a formalized process that includes securing the cooperation of the phone company. In the past, conducting the trace itself would take time, but nowadays, acquiring the location can be practically instantaneous. Wow, tracing has evolved over time. But there were no further calls. Kano checked his watch again. 20 minutes had now passed since the time was de designated for the ransom handoff. The kidnapper had yet to appear. Crap, you think we might have spooked him? He wondered aloud. Hey, stay calm. Sasayama scanned the passing throng. He's just playing with us. Why this guy even peeked this place? Connell's voice Connell voiced the question he'd been asking himself ever since he turned to kidnappers' demands. Sasayama shrugged. Feared he must want to blend in with the crowd, nab the money, and disappear before anyone knows he's there. Would be my guess. In that case, why not pick Shinjuku or Ginza? The big crowd didn't just benefit the kidnapper after all. It also allowed the police to use the sea of people to conceal their own operation. Right now, there were 50 detectives stationed within a 30 meter radius where he of where Hitomi stood. The kidnapper will be taking a major risk if this plan was to, if his plan was to nab the ransom money and run. That's what bothered Kano. Any criminal with half a brain would know better than to do a handoff in front of Hachiko. You're overthinking things, pal, Sasayama grumbled. No, I'm not. Kano reached into his pocket and pulled out his notepad. This was Kano's dick diary. Interesting name. Which he always kept close at hand. Sasayama rolled his eyes. Bad thing again? Kano ignored him, flipping through the not notepad pages. Ah, here it is. Dick dictum number 89. The more irrelevant something seems, the more relevant it's bound to be. It was a favorite saying of Kyozo Tateno, an assistant inspector from the Shibuya precinct. Tateno was the kind of detective Kano aspired to be. For the current operation, he'd, play, he'd been placed in charge of Hitomi's personal safety. He was in position to defend her as soon as the ransom had been handed off. Of course, Hitomi hadn't been informed of how much protection she was under. There was a risk that if she acted too secure, it might alert the kidnapper. I think Tatano has the right idea. Sasayama snorted quietly. Maybe. I mean, he's a great detective. Don't get me wrong. But do you know how many irrelevant things are to consider? There are to consider? Again, Kano ignored him. It didn't matter if nobody else understood. Kano had faith in Tatano. As both a detective and as an individual. An individual. He had first witnessed Tatano's brilliance during a standoff at a financial company three years earlier. A man had shot himself in an office, splashing gasoline everywhere and threatening to set the place ablaze. While the others hesitated, Tatano unflinchingly doused himself with gasoline and strode into the building, where he managed to talk the man down and secure the scene. Sheesh! The others had been awestruck by Tatano's actions. And Kano, who at the time had been content to be a run-of-the-mill policeman, had found it quite inspiring. Uh, 
I just saved again. Still, you know? So see, I'm a mur mummer under his breath. As great of a detective as Tatana was, it's not like anyone else in the world has ever heard of him. I suppose not, Kano said. So? Only time anyone ever hears a cop's name is if he's caught up in some scandal or killed in the line of duty. I mean, doesn't really seem fair, does it? Connell just shrugged. It was a strange definition of unfair, really. I mean, you've got a celebrity, you've got celebrity chefs and celebrity hairdressers and stuff. It's all come no celebrity gumshoes, you know? Look, please. Can you just focus on what we're doing here? Connell rubbed his eyes and then turned his attention back to Hitomi. What's the matter? Didn't sleep? Not enough, I guess. Did you eat? Didn't have time. Between bringing in supplies for the base operations, readying the team's vehicles, photocopying hundreds of documents and various other tasks, Kano had barely slept the previous night and hadn't gotten a meal in either. Base of operations usually set up in the large room at the precinct, such as an auditorium. MPD and precinct investigators assemble there, and communications, equipment, investigation resources, and such are brought in. Because of the scale and scope of these activities, newspaper reporters can be liable to notice. And so, in such cases, uh, in, in cases such as kidnapping, where the victim's personal safety is at stake, the flow of information is highly controlled. What have you been doing? Sasayama puffed out his chest. Saving up my energy for today. So you were sleeping. Kano gave a right chuckle as partner Sakashi. There he is. Kuzi's voice chirped suddenly through Kano's earpiece. A man in his 20s, wearing a sleeveless red jacket. He's carrying a garbage bag. A young man had emerged from the crowd, about 15 feet from where Hitomi was standing. He strode toward her, a sinister look on his face. He didn't match Hitomi's description, but Kano felt a jolt of nerves all the same. Maybe the kidnapper had hired some young street punk to snatch the ransom payment. That our guy? What do you think, Kano? Sasayama whispered. Yeah, I think he's gotta be. This was it. Kano swallowed the lump in his throat. He bent his knees ready to act fast. Blood rushed to his leg muscles, banishing the stiffness that be that begun to take hold. Could this be the culprit? Or perhaps... This young man tried to snatch the brief, clay the brief case from Hitomi, but she clung to it with desperate strength. It was him. The detectives rushed in. Whoa, hey, what the hell? The young man cried out frantically and tried to dart away, but the officers closed in, forcing him to forcing him bodily to the ground. Target secured. Oh, jeez, I think we've got another suspect on the scene. He's taking the ransom! Kuzay's hysterics made Kano spin around. Sure enough, a foreign-looking man was sprinting away, a tasha case in hand. The mob of detectives scrambled to pursue. Before Kano could react, most of them had run off, leaving him to look after the original suspect. What should I do with this guy, sir? He might have some connection to the kidnapper. Should I bring him in? Huh? Oh, sure, that'd be swell. I'm on it. With the help of one of the remaining detectives, Kano brought the suspect back to the Shibuya precinct. Can I save? Or does it literally autosave? I don't know. We're, we're, we're continuing until it saves again. Look, how many times do we have to go through this? Cut the crap. In the interrogation room, a, the young man who gave his name as Achi Endo steadfastly insisted on his innocence. 
Why did you try to steal that case? Kana watched Achi's face intently. Like I said, it looked happy. It looked heavy, so I was just trying to help her out. It wasn't inconceivable that a young guy would want to help a pretty girl. But Hitomi had been standing there, hardly in desperate need of assistance. She hadn't set the case down, so I figured there'd be something important inside. An entry from Kano's dick diary shot through his mind. Dick, dictum 25. When the tongue slips, grab it and yank out the truth. Classic advice for questioning. Something important, you say? Such as? How the heck would I know, Ashi spat. He huffed and slumped back in his chair. The standard textbook back and forth had been going on for nearly an hour. Kano didn't mind. Chasing down criminals was all well and good. But the questioning, the questioning suspects was another key part of the job. Plenty of off-the-scene work went into cracking the case. Once again, he had Achi explain what he'd been doing staring, starting from the beginning. When Kano finally emerged from the interrogation room for a short break, he learned that there had been some progress on the case in the crime scene. What the police hadn't been able to determine yet, however, was whether or not Maria was safe. Finding back in his, anxiety, his anxiety, Kano consulted his dick diary. Dick, dictum number 54, haste makes waste. He felt his tension subside, remembering the right maxim always helped. It was like casting a magic spell. Kano returned to confront Achi more, once more. You were there to act as a distraction, to mess up the investigation. Weren't you? Huh? Achi looked a bit dumbfounded. What are you on about? Dick dictum number 55. The truth hungers to be free. You hungry? Got some katsudon if you like. Japanese dish consisting of a bowl of white rice topped with breaded pork, cutlet, and egg. There are several variations such as sauce katsudon, where the egg is replaced with Worcestershire sauce, and misu, miso katsudon, where the pork is stewed, in mis is stewed in miso. Not typically the sort of thing a policeman offers the suspect during the interrogation. This could be seen as baiting with food, and is to be avoided. Achi nodded slightly. Achi devoured the bowl of katsudon with gusto. He looked like he hadn't eaten in a while. Alright then. Spill it. What's this guy after? Achi just shrugged. Oh. He murmured, a thick slice of egg latent pork between his teeth. How many accomplices do you have? Kano asked. But Achi just shook his head as he inhaled the food. Resignedly, Kano flipped through his notebook once more. Let's see, number 115. Use the lights to your advantage. As the minutes ticked past, he found himself referring to his book again and again, trying a dozen different methods to tease out whatever his suspect might be, might be hiding. The experience began to feel strangely surreal. There are two voices echoing hollowly in the interrogation room. Eventually, Kano looked at the clock and realized that the questioning had been going on for nearly five hours. Jesus Christ. He still hadn't made any headway. What was he supposed to do next? Tatano would know, but he sure didn't. Still, he was determined to do whatever he could to keep the victim and her family safe. Gritting his teeth in frustration, he perused the dick diary like it was scripture. Number 116. Monotonous questioning was clearly tiring Achi out. His eyelids drooped like they were beginning to get heavy. Number 117. Get when they're tired. Kano's eyes gleamed. You're part of some criminal gang, huh? Achi's head slumped forward heavily. Nodding off was basically the same as nodding yes. Alright? Mr. Kuse, I did it! The young guy we grabbed is at the handoff site. He finally confessed to the crime. No, he didn't. Kano, what are you doing? What? What are you talking about? Because they laughed in disbelief. We're just about to apprehend the mastermind here. Huh? Kano clutched his cell phone, dumbstruck. Listen, why don't you, uh. Look, just wait there at HQ, okay? No. It can't be. I, I After the kidnapping case wrapped up, Kano tendered his resignation. 
Guess I'm not cut out to be a detective after all, he thought to himself. He dropped the dick diary on his desk as he left the Shibuya precinct for the last time. That was a bad end! Kano round wound up at a bad end, however, this does not mean that the choice you made for Kano was the wrong one. One of the other protagonists, Achi Endo, has an impact on Kano's fate here. You can avoid a bad end by making proper decisions. In another character story, for a detailed hint, check the tip by underlining the bad end. Kano had every reason to suspect Achi Endo, but arresting him turned out to be a mistake. If Achi hadn't approached Hitomi, this wouldn't have happened. Try playing Achi's story up to 10.30 and make a choice that keeps him from going up to her. If you do that, Kano won't even have a chance to arrest him, and things should play out differently. Ah! So this is how it's working. You can also like Achi Endo, one of the other protagonists. Let's follow Acho's story, Achi's story for a little while. Okay, let's at least get Achi started. And when it saves... I thought I was gonna have to censor something. Achi Endo called out the door to his father's room. Called out at the door to his father's room. Okay, I'm heading out. Sure. His father sounded unconcerned. He didn't even open the door. Sure you don't want me to stay here in the shop? It's not like we're gonna get any customers. Achi grimaced. Yeah, I guess not. The door by the front door held a stack of heavy-duty trash bags. Achi pulled a few of them out. Guess it's gonna be that kind of day. He stuffed the trash bags into his pocket, then slipped on his favorite pair of sneakers. The entryway to Achi's home also led into the family shop. Various pieces of electronics were piled up like so much junk in the tiny retail space. The slightest bump brought the risk of an avalanche. Achi wove his way through the gaps in the appliances like a spelunker exploring a cave. From Shibuya Station, if you make your way past the 109 building, then up through Dogenzaka, you'll, you'll come across an old shopping district. Nestled in its outskirts is Endo Electronics, in the same place it's been for decades. Within its dimly lit interior, you'll find rows of wares all caked in dust. At a glance, you might well assume the place was closed. A mom-and-pop place like Endo's couldn't compete with the big consumer chains booming throughout Shibuya. So far, the store had remained in business thanks to the locals who appreciated that they made house calls to do repairs. But things weren't looking so good for the future. Achi, the oldest son and nominal successor to the business, had no interest in whatsoever in working there. Achi stepped out of the shop and into the sunny morning air. The good weather lifted his spirits. Alrighty, time to do this! He unfurled one of the garbage bags, which caught the wind and fluttered like a cape. Then he slowly made his way towards Shibuya Station, scanning his surroundings all the while. Okay, it just saved. I'm gonna end the episode here. In the next episode, we'll see how we can change Kano's fate with Achi. That'll be in the next episode. Until then, this is the Gamer Girl, signing off. Bye bye